and I won't, and I am committed. And I can't be discouraged enough to turn around, and I can't lose enough to cause me to quit. Because when Jesus called me into his army, I had nothing. So if I end up with nothing, I'll still be the victor. Devils can't stop me. People can't disillusion me. Weather can't stop me. Sickness can't wear me. Battles can't defeat me. And money definitely can't buy me. Because I'm a soldier. And I won't give up. I won't let up. And I won't be turned around. Because here's where I stand. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, that after you have done all you can to stand, stand therefore. So my question to each and every one of you tonight at the sound of my voice is where will you be standing? Hallelujah. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just want to say thank you, Father God, first and foremost for allowing me to come before your people once again, Father God, your sheep, to give them what you've already given me, to teach them what you've already taught me, to preach unto them what you've already preached to me, Father God, and to feed them what you've already fed me. I also want to thank you, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, for continuing to forgive me of all of my sins, Father God, past, present, and future, my sins of omission as well as my sins of commission. Because, Father God, I know I have fallen short of your glory, and I know I've missed the mark on several occasions. Also, thank you, Father God, for continuing to forgive me of all the offenses that I have committed against others, God, intentionally and unintentionally. So as I pray these prayers before you and these cloud of witnesses that they will not fall upon their fears. And it is in Jesus' mighty, holy, and precious name that I pray and give thanks. Amen. Now let the church hear what the Spirit is saying. My, 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 my. Get ready, get ready, get ready. It's SWAT time, y'all. Spiritual warfare advanced teaching. And you already know who this is. God's warrior. Bishop Shaolin M.B. Abrams Sr. And I just want to thank each and every one of you who thought it not robbery to join us again for another time of teaching. Yes, it's teaching time. So, if you do not want to hear the unadulterated word of God, this is not the place for you to be. Because not only do I preach, but I also teach the whole counsel of God. From Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. Because as I said time and time again, that my words mean absolutely nothing when it comes to the word of God. And if at any time you miss anything that I say or any of the scriptures that I give, then you, this broadcast is being recorded so you can hear it in its entirety on our website. And I will give you that information at the end of the lesson. So let us get started because we are in another chapter of our spiritual warfare series with the Christian fight. We're in lesson number five as we talk about walking with God in real time. Walking with God in real time. That's the subject lesson that we're in. And as always, I always begin with the scripture that I previously end with, ended with and we left off in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, as we are going to examine why and how one walks with God in real time. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, despite this plain statement, many through the ages have attempted to do so through mere relig religiosity, through mere religion. Cain is the Bible's first example of this. Now, nothing in scripture indicates that he wasn't religious. Genesis 4 and 3 shows that he and Abel met with God at a set time, given the sense of an occasion previously appointed and agreed upon. Now, Cain is a type of the typical worldly religious person. He has God somewhat in mind, but he doesn't believe God really means all that he says like a lot of folks right in the body of Christ. He chooses what he will believe, revealing the major unbridgeable gap in his faith. Now, I'm going to talk about 14 biblical statements on faith importance, and all of them apply during the sanctif 
sanctification period of a Christian's life. Number one, Romans 5, 1 and 2 says that faith gains a person's acceptance before God. Faith gains a person's acceptance before God. Number two, Romans 4 and 20 declares that faith glorifies God. Faith glorifies God. As we read earlier in our opening scripture, Hebrews 11 and 6 reveals that faith pleases God and he will reward it. Faith pleases God and he will reward it. Number five. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Number four. I'm sorry. Number four. Uh, Isaiah 38 and 3 states that faith is expressed in humble and loyal sincerity. Faith is expressed in humble and loyal sincerity. Number five. Ephesians 2 and 8 announces that by grace through faith, a convicted and repentant sinner is saved. Grace through faith, a convicted and repentant sinner is saved. Number six, Ephesians 3 and 17 affirms that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. Number seven, Galatians 2 and 20 proclaims that we live by faith. We live by faith. Number eight, Romans 11 and 20 asserts that we stand before God by faith. We stand before God by faith. Second Corinthians 5 and 7, number nine, confirms that we walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5 and 7 confirms that we walk by faith. First Peter 5, 8 and 9 shows that we can successfully resist Satan by faith. Number 10, we can successfully resist Satan by faith. Acts 26 and 18 establishes that we are experimentally sanctified by faith. That we are experimentally sanctified by faith. Number 11. Number 12, Ephesians 3, 11 and 12 insists that by faith, we have boldness to access God. We have access by faith to boldness to God. Number 13, 1 Timothy 6 and 12 explains that faith sustains us to fight the good fight. Faith sustains us to fight the good fight. And last but not least, number 14, 1 John 5 and 4 demonstrates that we can overcome the world by faith. We can overcome the world by faith. So the overall lesson of Enoch's life is that, as important as it is, justification is merely a beginning. It's another thing altogether to continue living by faith, but the sanctification period and the cost of being a living sacrifice to God drive human nature to devise theological lies like the eternal security doctrine, also known as once saved, always saved. And we know that that's not true. We know that we have to die in Christ. The Bible says that those who endure to the end shall be saved. So just because you accept Christ don't mean that, you know, you're going to heaven. Just, you know, it don't mean that. You have to live that faithful, holy, and righteous life to the end. To the day you take your last breath in life. So Enoch literally lived a life in which the central issue, his driving force, was his faith in God. Now looking at this entirely spiritually, a truth that is important to humility emerges. Just as Enoch's physical translation from one geographical area to another was supernatural, so was his spiritual translation from a cardinal, earthly, self-centered person to a God, Christ, kingdom of God-centered person. Now the Bible shows that the heart is the source of our motivations according to 
Matthew uh, chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. Listen to what it says. Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses 17 through 20 says this. And this is live, so give me a couple minutes to bring this up. It says, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach is an eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. But still, wash your hands before you eat. So, for our hearts to function by faith, we need what God makes possible only through his calling. Our hearts must change. I'm trying to help somebody tonight. Let me say that again. Our hearts must change. My God. Now, the Bible refers to this as circumcision made without hands. So living by faith is what pleases God. However, we have that faith only when God supernaturally translates us into the beginning stages of his realm of living, called in the Bible, eternal life. Now Hebrews 11.6 is a scriptural bridge that applies directly to both Enoch and Noah. But Noah's example of his use of faith seems insignificant because it's contained with only one verse. But it's significant by illustrating the practical daily use of faith throughout life. Ezekiel 14, 13, and 14 includes Noah in an exclusive list. It says, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off uh, its supply of bread, send famine on it, man and beef from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. So God is setting the examples and reputations of these three men as standards of faithful, righteous behavior under stressful circumstances for us to follow and strive to reproduce. Even the order is interesting. Obviously, Noah was the first chronologically. But Job lived long before Daniel, perhaps even a thousand years before him. Yet Daniel precedes Job on the list. Was one more righteous, more respected than the other, perhaps? Are they in the order of the severity of what they endured, their righteousness being equally worthy? Maybe. However, God usually lists things in the order he wants them considered, and Noah is listed first. Whatever God's reason, Noah accomplished a significant witness, persevering for a long, very time under horrific conditions. Now, his witness was of sterling quality and worthy of emulation. Hebrews 11, 6 and 7 recounts his faithful life. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that, that he is what? That he's God. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, these two verses appear quite innocuous. We read them and consider their teaching a matter, of course, regarding Christian salvation. However, for this world's Christianity, they pose a dilemma 